watching Reason and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael, joined by Father Joseph Matlack, an Eastern Catholic priest. He's been on the show multiple times, and we're talking about ethnophilatism. But before we uh, define our terms here, let me just welcome you back to the show. How are you, Father Joseph? I'm very well, and thank you for your welcome. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm excited about this topic, but I know it's a little bit of a hot topic, you know, <laughs> hot button issue. Uh, here. So could you maybe start us out with defining terms before we dive in too far? Because I think the term ethnophilatism, some people might not necessarily be familiar with the term, but I think they recognize it as soon as we explain what it is. So can you tell us what exactly is this? Yes. Well, I think the best way to look at it is to focus on that first word, ethno, which sounds very much like the English word ethnic, or it's a Greek word. Um, so, and, and it, what it is, it's, it's considering um, ethnic matters. And when it comes to the Eastern churches, it has to do with the notion of how does ethnicity uh, factor into the, uh, not just the practice, but perhaps even the identity of a, a particular church, in this case, the Eastern churches, whether Orthodox or Catholic. So, and philatism, well, the word philatism comes from a Greek word which uh, means uh, race or tribe. So uh, it has to do with uh, the notion of um, ethnophilatism in the Eastern churches. So how does uh, a focus on one's ethnicity, on one's racial identity, and also uh, of, of one's nationality. So oftentimes you will hear people refer to nationalism, ethno-nationalism, or, or whatever, or, or with regards to the Eastern churches. And uh, I think this is um, more relatable to the Eastern churches in a sense, um, as I will argue, not in and of themselves, but, but because of what they have been described as being. So you have the uh, Greek church, the Russian church, the Ukrainian church, church, the Romanian church, and so on. And uh, it, it has developed uh, this way, at least historically, at least in recent memory, where uh, an Eastern church, whether Orthodox or Catholic, seems to be identified with a specific ethnic or cultural or national grouping as opposed to another church. Um, I mean, I think the big uh, the big other would be here the Latin or the Roman Church, which even though we do use that that uh, nomenclature Latin or Roman, it's not uh, it's not usually understood as that which belongs to the Italian people or that which is Italian in and of itself. Uh, so therefore, historically, they have they have uh, developed in different ways. So there is something that has come to be whether, you know, that accidentally, if you will, uh, come to be identified with the Eastern churches with regards to ethnicity, racial, and national concerns that hasn't uh, been uh, so strongly identified or found within Latin uh, or Roman Christianity, whether Catholic or even Protestant. You know, it's it's curious because I recall scrolling through social media about a year ago, and I came across a person who posted something to the effect that, oh, I just had my, you know, DNA tested to find out what my ethnicity is, and I'm about 6% Slavic. And evidently, he goes to a Slavic uh, Orthodox church. I don't know if it was in communion with Rome or, or outside of communion, but it was was a Slavic, you know, of the um, Orthodox type kind of church. And so I, I thought, well, that's odd. Why would it matter if any, he, he saw this as, oh, this is great. I can somehow fit in with my church because I'm 6% Slavic now, as if it's a badge of honor to be a certain ethnicity, to be part of a particular group. Is, some, is this something you've encountered? And if so, what's the problem here? 
I have encountered it throughout my life. Um, ever since I started learning about the Eastern churches, uh, when I went to university and I learned about uh, Byzantine or Byzantine Christianity, as we say in England, and I got to know uh, the uh, Orthodox Christian communities and also got to know the Eastern uh, Catholic communities, um, I, I happen to be of Ukrainian descent. My father was born in what is now Ukraine, I think he lived in five countries without ever moving house because of the shifting of the borders. Uh, but I happened to, I knew that I was ethnically Ukrainian on my father's side. And so I entered into looking at the Eastern churches purely as an academic and as a spiritual thing because I was a Catholic. I was baptized a Catholic in infancy and I grew up a Catholic. And I happened to have been brought up in the Latin church, um, whereas I know by the paternal line, I should have been uh, brought up in my father's church. I had, I had no, um, I knew that I was ethnically Ukrainian, but I was not brought up uh, to believe that because of that, I belonged in the whatever Ukrainian church, whether Orthodox or Catholic. I did it simply as <clears throat> a development of my spiritual journey and my academic journey, which uh, led me to feel God's call into the Eastern Catholic churches, in, into, into a specific Eastern Catholic church. And from the very beginning of that journey, uh, whether for good or for ill, um, you know, people came at it from both sides. I was very much told that I, I belonged there for no other reason than my ethnic identity. Now, as I said, for good or for, or for other reasons. There were people that came at it from a very good and welcoming perspective, including one bishop who very graciously sat with me for uh, three hours. Um, that never happens, I'm sure, in the Latin West, sat with me for three hours. But uh, he, he did go beyond that. He gave me my first prayer book um, in the Eastern Catholic tradition. Uh, he also gave me a, a book on, on spirituality, on the Jesus prayer. So from the beginning, I did encounter that sort of spiritual focus. Uh, at the same time, I did feel that I was in the in crowd because uh, because of my ethnic identity. And then um, it, it's, so that was not simply with the Eastern Catholic churches, but when I was also befriending Orthodox Christians, some of whom were ethnic and yes, some of whom were not. And again, there was a, a welcoming spirit amongst those people. However, there, all, there was also a certain... Um, expectation, even if latent, even if tacit, that one has to at least be interested in the culture of that group. So I'll still remember going to a meeting many years ago with a group of Greek Orthodox Christians, and then at the end of that meeting, uh, they were planning for a youth event, and uh, it erupted into Greek dancing. Now, I happen to very much enjoy Greek dancing, so I thought it was fun and, and very enjoyable. But then I, I very much, when I was discerning uh, going to Eastern Christianity, I was battling in myself whether I should go Orthodox, because at that time, the Orthodox communities were bilingual. I didn't have to speak Greek or Russian. I was accepted as an, as an Anglophone, as an English speaker, whereas the Eastern Catholic churches in England, where I grew up, were almost all uh, non-Anglophone. And so I felt very much more at home in terms of my, my linguistic and cultural background in the Eastern Orthodox churches. But I did not wish, I did not feel comfortable leaving communion with Rome. And so I was torn with myself. Do I want to be Catholic or Orthodox? If I want to be Catholic and I still love Eastern Christianity, then I really have to get ethnic. I really have to get cultural. Um, and I was always uncomfortable with that, but I still saw smattering of that with the Orthodox. And I'm sure that many Orthodox Christians would have uh, similar experiences, perhaps even more so than I. Um, but I, I know that this is definitely uh, something within the Catholic communion. Uh, and I think in one sense, it's even stronger within the Catholic communion. Uh, I'll, I can explain further later, but um, I think when you have the Catholic communion of churches and the, the big brother, if you will, the larger Catholic church is the Latin church or the Roman church. And throughout the world, they are praying uh, in the vernacular, singing in the vernacular, teaching in the vernacular of the nation in which they are currently living, as opposed to another nation. Mm -hmm. 
then the presence of the Eastern Catholic churches in that same territory tends to be seen in comparison with that. So the Latin church almost comes to be seen as the what I call the default Catholic experience. And the Eastern Catholic churches, I would argue, perhaps a little more strongly than the Eastern Orthodox or even Oriental Orthodox, I'm not sure. The Latin church tends to be seen as more of the default, and the Eastern churches tend to be seen more of as uh, a subset for those who belong, for those in the in crowd. So for people like myself, who happen uh, to be ethnically linked with a group, um, and therefore those who are not, uh, there, there seems to me, there, see, there could seem uh, to be a little bit of a disconnect, and that might raise, at the very least, questions and curiosity that why are they there uh, or at worst it, it could lead into very uh, uncharitable and unchristian behavior and i have seen it i have seen enough of it to uh, to know that you know those two types of attitudes do exist now this is of course speaking theoretically and practically there are two different things so that's that's just been my experience in my very very long years of life so you know father what i've um I noticed something on social media, again, to kind of bring in another story, one of my observations. Um, actually, no, this wasn't a situation on social media. It was a, a conversation that I had with somebody, um, and they were telling me about their experience with the Ukrainian Catholic Church. They said that um, they normally go to a Latin rite church where it's it's usually in Latin, but they decided to check out the Eastern Catholic liturgy just to see what the divine liturgy of Chrysostom is like. And so they went to a local Ukrainian Catholic church, and it was entirely in Ukrainian, and they did not understand any of it. Now, they were somewhat used to not really understanding the liturgy, going to a Latin liturgy, um, but they also felt like, okay, well, I, I see the beauty of this experience, but I'm not really understanding it. And I guess they were expecting um, to actually hear something in the vernacular rather than Ukrainian. Um, could you maybe comment on this? Because I think that what happens is people will visit these churches, and in some cases it might be off-putting because they don't understand that language. Do you think that whenever a church has something that's not in the vernacular, a liturgy, that it's not necessarily conducive for evangelization? Or is that really just not the purpose of the liturgy? It's not to evangelize people. What, what are your thoughts here? Well, I think the Ukrainian tradition or the Kievan Christian tradition will actually suggest very strongly that the liturgy is at least somewhat of an evangelizing force. <clears throat> because the story, of course, of the emissaries of uh, the Grand Prince who went to Constantinople in order to determine which religion to bring back. And it was through an encounter with the liturgy in the Church of the Holy Wisdom in Hagia Sophia, where these uh, emissaries apparently said, we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth. We know that God dwells there among those people. Um, that in and of itself is part of the Kievan, Ukrainian, if you will, history of the church. And the very... The very experience and the example of St. Cyril and Methodius, the teachers of the Slavs, the Slavs as a whole, uh, also proves um, that uh, the liturgy is supposed to be something that is in inculturated into the life of the people. St. Cyril and Methodius uh, taking the liturgical books and, and the gospel and translating them into the language of the people mm -hmm. where they were going to serve. And, and from that, uh, a whole um, expression of Christianity was formed. And so you have those two examples, St. Cyril and Methodius and uh, Grand Prince of Kiev, uh, Vladimir slash Volodymyr, where, whichever way you would like to pronounce it. Um, and then, of course, um, you mentioned, you know, vernacular instead of Ukrainian. I mean, Ukrainian is a vernacular up until only a few decades ago the uh, Catholic Church in Ukraine, the, the Greco-Catholic, the Eastern Catholic Church in Ukraine, had been praying in Church Slavonic, which mm -hmm. is somewhat similar, I guess, but uh, but also different from the vernacular in which in which people spoke. And of course, language evolves, and so vernaculars become uh, further and further distanced from those sacral, you know, liturgical languages, if you will. 
uh, th there is enough of a difference, enough of a difference so much so that nowadays, uh, even though many Eastern Catholics in Ukraine are returning to praying in Slavonic, uh, in church Slavonic, sometimes whole services, I've, I've been there and I've heard it, they will be accused of being Russians and of praying in Russian. Uh, whereas they, they are not. They're simply praying in Slavonic, and some words just happen to sound like or happen to be either very similar or the same as Russian words. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's something that, that has to be remembered. And I remember once, um, you know, praying in English in one of our parishes, and the parishioner was very unhappy with me uh, and, and saying that, well, you know, the martyrs, the Ukrainian martyrs, died so that we could serve in this language. To which I responded, no, they didn't. They died to pray in Church Slavonic, which is what they were doing, because if you look at the books in those days, they were in Church Slavonic. Certainly they, they must have been preaching in the vernacular, perhaps even doing prayers and devotions in the vernacular, but uh, the, the liturgical books were still in, in Slavonic for at least a few more decades, at least in the early part of the, the Soviet persecution. So I'm thinking of the earlier part of the 20th century. And I, I was telling this story to one of our bishops who was giggling because he realized the irony of, 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 of that. So, yes, uh, the, the notion of vernacular, if you will, uh, more of a vernacularizing, is something that is within the experience of the Eastern churches, including my own, which is the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Is ethnophilatism a heresy? For various reasons, yes, it is. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to be very clear on that, uh, but th there's, it's important to understand why. And I think in order to do that, I'm not going to refer to a book. I can refer to, uh, let's say, the gospel, you know, um, Matthew 28, 19. Uh, Christ says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and I'm, I'm with you always to the close of the age. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 to 20. That's our uh, manual. That's our cry. And in fact, I, I adopted it as my motto, if you will, um, which is actually um, ironic because a friend of mine uh, offered one day, he, he designs coats of arms. He's very skilled in this. And, and he said to me one day, oh, I'll just design your coat of arms. And he asked me one day, what do you want your motto to be? And I chose Make disciples of all nations. I show, and, in, and I had it written in Greek. And when he plugged that into Google Translate, it came out as school all the ethnics. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that that was a double entendre. Yes. So I was going to make disciples of all the nations and I was going to school the ethnics in my experience, what the gospel actually is. And then St. Paul talks about the importance of this throughout in, in his epistle, especially 1 Corinthians, where he says, you know, there are some who say, I belong to this person, or I, say, I, belong, to, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos. And, and Paul says, uh, you know, uh, uh, Paul only uh, plants, Apollos waters, but God is the one who gives the growth to, to that. And uh, we're all, we all, we belong to God. We don't belong to the people. And, and you know, at least direct, you know, indirectly through the people to God. And then in 1 Corinthians 9, he says something similar, that I have become all things to all people so that I might save some. And then elsewhere, he also says, you know, there's neither Jew nor Greek nor male nor female. All are one Christ. Um, of course, he's you know, obviously qualified, but still male and female. What he means is that ultimately we belong to Christ. And this is clearly the teaching of, of the church. Um, I, I even looked through the catechism. Uh, the Christ our Pascha, the Ukrainian Catholic Catechism. And it's very clear uh, that the gospel has to be preached. Uh, the, well, firstly, it, it understands the gospel has been preached to various nations. Yes, so it has been enculturated and various traditions have, have arisen because it's just a, but the, the power of the gospel is that that's, it's, so it's incarnational. Uh, the gospel is incarnated like Cyril and Methodius did with and for a specific group of people, and that's the genius of the gospel. So it's a very incarnational thing theologically. Um, and it also quotes Cyril and Methodius. And it also says how the gospel can help that culture to develop. So the culture is influencing the gospel, but the gospel influences the culture in, in reverse. 
Um, at the same time, the catechism is very clear that this is something that has to keep happening and that's something that must happen to all the nations. So, uh, because the gospel has to be enculturated everywhere in the diversities of, of, of human cultures, languages, and nations. And then the catechism is very clear that the, the church uh, is apostolic by nature, which means it is, it is sent forth by nature, and it says this, to all the nations, to fashion from all of them one people of God. And that's what the, the mandate of the church is to evangelize all the nations because the church is also Catholic. The Catholicity of the church means its universality, which means it cannot be said to be simply of this or of that expression as something that is somehow uh, innate in its identity, as something that belongs to its nature. And, and I'll even just you know quote here um, from uh, that, that same catechism, paragraph 303, uh, a very important sign of a self-governing church, so it's talking about Sui Juris Eastern Church, a, a very important sign of that is her missionary orientation, which is made manifest in preaching Christ's gospel to non-Christians of various nations and cultures. So it's, it's saying very clearly that an Eastern Church cannot even be considered Sui Juris by nature if it doesn't share in that missionary orientation and vocation to all the various nations and cultures. It does say that there is a place for love of one's country, one's fatherland, and it uses the phrase patriotism as opposed to, and it says it here, um, <clears throat> hatred or belittlement of other nations or chauvism, chauvinism or racism. So there is a difference there. Patriotism as a virtue, as love of of one's, you know, uh, it, it actually it says that it has to do with the fourth commandment, you know, the love of one's father and mother. It's sort of it's an offshoot of that, but it's not the same as as being uh, sort of a negative view of other people. And ethnophilatism, it can have that negative view. So we define ourselves by what we are, and therefore, and here's the problem: therefore, we exclude anything and everything that is not what we have defined in and of it, it to somehow suggest that what we are demands that by its very nature and then the second vatican council in its document on the eastern churches goes on and says that uh, all of the sui Juris churches are of equal dignity none is superior to another and they also enjoy the same rights and obligations quote, also in respect of preaching the gospel to the whole world, end quote. And canon law picks this up as well, that uh, canon 584 of the Eastern Code. Uh, the church, um, uh, following the mandate of Christ to, to evangelize all the nations, recognizes herself to be totally missionary, totally missionary. And evangelization, it goes on to say, is something that, yes, can be expressed in the cultures of individual peoples. So it's the same thing. What we do is we incarnate the gospel, we take the gospel, and we preach it to the people where we are and, and, and to whom we are serving so that they can be part of this as well. So it's nothing that, it's not, it's not an exclusionary thing. It's actually an inclusive thing. And... Um, and so this is really the teaching of the church, that um, the church is there to preach the gospel uh, to all the nations uh, and not simply to one's own nation. Now, that's not to say, for example, that um, every missionary has to go throughout the whole world to every country and preach. It's just to say that this is what the church is in and of herself. Whereas ethnophilatism, and, and you know, now I want to just go back to that, the Synod of Constantinople in 1872, which is Eastern Orthodox, which for those who don't know, was, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, 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 it attempted to address, at the time, there was the, the desire to establish um, a jurisdiction for the Bulgarian Orthodox Christians in the territory of the Patriarch of Constantinople. And uh, I think you know, Synod said, you know, this has never happened before because of the notion of one bishop and one city. So we take care of all the Orthodox faithful. And what the Synod comes out with is um, a declaration that says, we renounce, we censure, and we condemn philatism, that is racial discrimination, ethnic feuds, 
hatreds and dissensions within the Church of Christ as contrary to the teaching of the gospel and the holy canons of our blessed fathers. So uh, if we're looking at a church as somehow, uh, in a positively, if you will, we are incarnating the gospel uh, within a specific group of people and culture so as to evangelize that culture, then that's obviously not heresy. In fact, that's very orthodox. That's an extension of Christ's incarnation. But if we identify uh, the church and her activity as something that is um, meant only for a specific group of people, designed only for a specific group of people in and of itself, well, that's a negative, that's an exclusionary thing. And that's actually not Christian at all. In fact, it's probably more pagan than anything else. And, uh, and unfortunately, that tends to be a, a common-ish occurrence, at least traditionally, uh, amongst the Eastern churches. Um, and in my experience, I can speak more to the Eastern Catholic churches. So a long answer to your question. Well, I can see th how the gospel would need to be enculturated and, you know, the incarnation of Christ in a particular culture. I, I can completely see that, for example, in Ukraine, right? I can see how that would apply to the Ukrainians. But why is it that then Ukrainian Catholicism is taken outside of Ukraine and it's still called Ukrainian Catholic. Does that not suggest ethnophilatism? Does that not work against the missionary spirit? So, yes, I think <clears throat> in answer to your question, um, let's look at, you know, the Latin church, Latin Catholicism. Now, of course, once upon a time, Latin, uh, well, it still is the official language of the liturgy, the, the official language of the church, but de facto most communities have decided to adopt at least either all the vernacular or most of the liturgy in the vernacular uh, but it has in doing so it has allowed for what many american friends of mine call heinz 57 effect so this sort of melding of people of different ethnic backgrounds that have uh, mixed you know through intermarriage and breeding and, and new families where all of those original um, allegiances were subsumed at the very least. And so you ask an average person, you know, what, what are you? They'll say, well, I'm American. Well, what are you ethnically? What's your origin? Well, I'm German, Scotch, Irish, etc. Italian, Spanish, French, uh, Native, uh, Native American even, or, or South American, as, as is the case more and more. Um, now, that's an interesting thing. And uh, just as a footnote, um, the the predominance, the prevalence of Hispanic Catholics is, I would say, akin to the Eastern uh, Christian experience. But in my experience, it has been a little bit differently. It has been a little bit different because even Hispanics, uh, they, 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 there hasn't necessarily been such a, a strong reaction to non-Hispanic Roman Catholicism by Hispanics. They may not go necessarily but there seems to be a qualitatively different reaction to non-ethnic Eastern Catholics. Now, I think the answer, part of it has to do with the immigration. So, especially in my church, we've had four slash five waves of immigrants. My father came from the World War II immigration where he went to England. And what happens is with each uh, wave of immigration, <clears throat> these Eastern Catholics are coming and the church does things for them in their language. And then they have children. And then those children sometimes marry their own, sometimes marry others. And then they, their, their vernacular, their first language becomes the language of the country in which we're in. So English, for example. And then they have children. And then the next wave has come along. And I think what's happening is with each wave, the church pastorally attempts to respond to that. But in doing that, somehow the Eastern churches have not been very successful in providing for the, um, the, the descendants of the original wave and concomitantly new, newcomers in, in, most, in many cases. I know some cases where they have done that very well, but not always. And I think that, <clears throat> so we're looking at, you know, I gave you the theory earlier, the theological theory. Now we're looking at the practice. And I find that 
in practice, there are problems. And look, look at, for example, the delineation and the nomenclature of the Eastern churches. Uh, we are called, uh, uh, well, firstly, you know, eparchies are established along ethnic lines. We have four Ukrainian eparchies, four Ruthenian eparchies, uh, two Maronite eparchies, one Melkite eparchy, one Romanian eparchy, and various other eparchies of which I'm unaware, all of whom, uh, the, the faithful of all of whom, are probably smaller than some mega Roman Catholic parishes in the United States. But we still s seem to have to divide these things according to ethnicity. So there's a multiplication of things. And then vis-a-vis uh, -vis Latin dioceses. So again, it, it contributes to that mentality that the Latin uh, Catholicism is the sort of the default for those who don't wish to be ethnic. But if you wish to be ethnic, here's your little jurisdiction over there. Here's your little corner. Here's your little ghetto. But also the nomenclature of those dioceses. So a Latin diocese, for example, is given the term the Diocese of New York, Diocese of Charlotte, Diocese of Washington, D.C., or the church thereof. Whereas Eastern churches sometimes are given the eparchy of St. So-and-so in this town. But if you look at some of the Latin designations, it's, it's you know, somewhat interesting slash problematic. For example, our Arch Eparchy of Philadelphia is called the Arch Eparchy of Philadelphia of Ukrainians, Ukrainorum, or of the Ukrainians. And so the next question is, well, well, if you're educated, you might ask that question. What does that mean? Is that a descriptive term or is that an ethnic term? Um, whereas the average run of the mill Catholic sees that and says, well, I'm not Ukrainian. That's not mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. And in Ukraine, of course, you just have the eparchy of town or city. And <clears throat> the churches, when I was over there, there was no, there's usually no sign in front of the churches. Everyone knew that that was the Greek Catholic Church or the Greco Catholic Church would go there for liturgy. But here, there is that descriptive. So churches will have signs. St. John the Baptist Catholic Church or Roman Catholic Church versus St. John the Baptist Ukrainian Catholic Church. So the, the first example is those for the default, those who wish to be non-ethnic. And the second one is for those who belong to that ethnic group. And there is a strong debate and also a strong argument for uh, questioning the use of those terms and perhaps even for removing them. Mm -hmm. uh, for pastoral reasons and for reasons of evangelization. And, and, and the fact that I said that, some will react to that as an anti, uh, you know, as, as something opposed to that group. And, uh, you know, I suppose that is theoretically possible for, if someone were to say that, but that's not what I'm saying. What I'm arguing is that, that those, those designations, that nomenclature, that, those delineations, they really have to be questioned because the question has to be asked, are they serving the gospel? Are they serving what we are or what we're meant to be as the church? And, and that, that has been a problem. So I, and I have argued this, and I do argue that, um, especially among some, you know, um, Ukrainian Catholic, I don't think we should use that terminology, at least as a public advertisement of who we are. That's not because I'm ashamed of who I am. I'm certainly not. It's just to say that, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier in my theological explanations, looking at the scripture, and looking at the teachings of the church, that the church is for everyone, uh, Ukrainians and non-Ukrainians alike. We happen to be descended of that, uh, from that expression, and we take our, our flavor and identity from that, just as Latin churches take their flavor from Rome, or at least, you know, in theory. But... No one said, well, therefore, this is the Italian Catholic Church, and you must be Italian to belong to the Italian Catholic Church. And everyone else is, as I've heard before, everyone else is a guest. Uh, they're welcome, they're guests, but this is for Italians. Uh, and I think that we as Eastern Churches have a, a lot to do in order to work with this. And it is a sensitive issue, and, uh, but, but it, 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 uh, it, it is urgent when... Uh, many, many of our faithful uh, leave for for reasons uh, for these reasons, which have nothing to do with the gospel, but have to do with something else. I wonder those who maintain an ethno 
ethnophilatist, I guess is the term, view. Um, I wonder how they deal with the fact that Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> you know, it, 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 especially if they're, again, expressing this from a non-Jewish perspective. Now, I know that there exists that also among um, Jews. But again, ha have you ever come across this? I mean, when people who maintain this position, what do they do when they're confronted with the reality that Jesus was Jewish? I can speak to my experience in the sense that I have encountered anti-Semitism mm -hmm. uh, amongst uh, you know, some Eastern Catholics. Mm -hmm. For example, um, in, in <clears throat> the Ukrainian tradition, we have the, the Bear of Taps at the Christmas play. And, you know, again, you've got to think culturally in Eastern Europe and the way that the, 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 the Jews uh, may have been approached. Now, again, there's probably two sides to the same coin. My father had a friend in his childhood who was a, a Jewish boy in his village. And my father, when the Nazis came through in 1941, he saw his friend being taken away, uh, presumably to a concentration camp. And my father not, uh, because he was uh, not, not Jewish. Um, mm -hmm. so there, were, there were good people and there were bad people everywhere. But I definitely have encountered anti-Semitism uh, even in, in the plays, in the cultural plays. And, uh, and it's something that is, is an issue. Um, and it stems from prejudices way, uh, way before my time. <clears throat> but, um, but I think, you know, I, I've even heard an argument that, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, Jesus was, um, was Ukrainian because, you know, he's from, you know, the book gospel says he's from Galilee and Galilee sounds a lot like Halilea, uh, sounds like Halichana, Halilea Halichana. And uh, Mary was Ukrainian because she wore the babi, the, the, the um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, the headscarf. So this, but again, you know, simplistic understandings and, and and not very deep historical understandings of of what this meant. I think the Jewishness of Jesus also is important to understand that you know Jesus was incarnate with a certain group of people, but then the gospel quickly went out to the Gentiles. So he sort of maintains both. He maintains that. The Jewishness, as, as Paul says, salvation is from the Jews, mm -hmm. but salvation is from the Jews intended for the Gentiles. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's when you understand the gospel that you can, you can balance these two things. Uh, to be, it's not, you know, to be Jewish is, is both crucial and beside the point. It's mm -hmm. crucial because it's, it's, they are God's people. Uh, God chose them uh, in whom to, to, to give us revelation. But that wasn't the end. Israel was intended to then expand throughout the world. A light to the nations. A light to the nations. You know, um, <laughs> just shifting gears slightly here, taking a, a brief detour, I saw the other day a Latin Rite Catholic say that the Latin Rite is superior to all of the other rites because it is the right of Rome. Um, and so clearly this person was at odds with the Second Vatican Council, which they were aware that they were at odds with it. But um, is this a version of ethnophilatism or is that just something different? It's just a ritual supremacy. Is it is it the same thing or is it different? I would probably call it more a ritual supremacy. I have encountered this myself, um, you know, in talking about the theory versus the practice. Um, I, I have encountered Latin brother priests who have reacted very strongly to our presence as Eastern Catholics in, uh, well, <clears throat> here in, in, in the Western world, with, you know, averting to the notion of canonical territory. Well, this is our canonical territory and you have your canonical territory over there and, and your, your expression of Christianity is good, but it really belongs in that cultural uh, milieu and so I've even been told by, you know, a couple of Latin priests that Eastern Catholics should not have a jurisdiction uh, outside of their traditional territory. They should not be conducting mission. They should not be evangelizing. They should return home to their traditional territories. And to which I, I replied, well, then does that mean that the Latins in those countries should close up shop and, and leave and that those dioceses should not exist? To which I, I had one priest respond. Well, no, the Latin rite is uh, is um, 
is universal. It can go anywhere and it should go everywhere because it's adaptable to every culture. But the Eastern, Eastern Christianity belongs over there. So I have seen that form of ritual supremacy and, and including the notion that <clears throat> because the Pope of Rome is a Latin, therefore the Latin rite is, is superior. Now, of course, that you have to ask the question, well, what about those Eastern popes in the early centuries of the church? Did they denature themselves and their Christianity and their ecclesial identity when they became popes of Rome? And if not, then why not? Yeah, it's 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 a curious phenomenon. So, uh, you know, some um, the big takeaway here, what, what would you say is the main takeaway that we should um, have when it comes to this issue? I mean, what are we really supposed to do, the average Catholic? I mean, there's not a whole lot that can really be done, um, I would imagine, on an individual level. So what's the main takeaway? Well, I think the main takeaway, <clears throat> what I hope is... I think we, we are, as Eastern Catholics, are continuing to expose ourselves, our tradition, to uh, Western Christians, whether Catholics or Protestants. But I think the main takeaway from this is for a serious examination of conscience for Eastern Catholics. And I know that some Eastern Catholics, uh, some Eastern Catholic jurisdictions might not have this problem, at least in, in theory. Uh, oftentimes people refer to the, the Byzantine Catholic Metropolia. Although I have, I have uh, seen, in my experience, um, a version of ethnophilitism even there. Um, mm -hmm. Ruthenians, uh, the, the, that word Ruthenian is also beginning to, to resurface more and more, mm -hmm. um, which I think is not necessarily a terrible thing because oftentimes I would hear, you know, oh, I'm Byzantine, you're Ukrainian. Well, no, that's, we're the same. We're both Byzantine. So, you know, that not necessarily bad, but also this, this um, <clears throat> push to identify with a, an ecclesial jurisdiction in Eastern Europe, and so that Ruthenian thing. So that's coming back. And I've also met Ruthenians who um, identify themselves as not Ukrainian. I <laughs> we are not Ukrainian. I still remember one time when I started harmonizing Ruthenia, the chant of the Ruthenian church. Now, I had... I had seen this in Mokachevo when I attended a very beautiful service with three, four part harmony, Greek Catholic, and I was corrected for harmonizing because that's a Ukrainian thing. We don't do that as Ruthenians, which is of course completely not, at least not practically true because I have seen it. Um, now, um, so my, my big takeaway uh, is, is and I hope that the message gets to those jurisdictions that might still struggle with this, whether Eastern European or uh, Balkan, Mediterranean, Arab, uh, even, even other Eastern jurisdictions. Some uh, are, are more strongly identified with an ethnic base than others. And I want to appeal mainly to you know, both, well, both the clergy and the laity, but to the clergy, to, to ask the clergy to really ask themselves, how are they governing? their church, whether the diocese in the case of our beloved hierarchs, whether, you know, um, uh, parishes in the case of my beloved brother priests, how are they approaching their mission pastorally? You know, are they, are they averting to ethno philatistic nationalistic ways of being the church as though their ministry is sort of an ethnic chaplaincy? And, uh, or, you know, or how are, how are they how are they doing that are they are they simply out to find ethnic members of their church and I've, I've seen this before you know eastern catholic clergy are convinced that their uh, evangelizing efforts should be to go out and find you know ukrainians or whoever whatever ethnic group that is and refer to terms like the diaspora our people uh, our nation versus guests um, and so those clerics, bishops, priests, are oftentimes seen as ethnarchs than, than as priests. And conversely, I think the people also do the same. Lay people should undergo serious examination of conscience. How are they viewing their priests? Are they viewing their priests as, as, as ministers of the gospel or are they viewing them as ethnarchs? And, and in many cases, they do view us as ethnarchs. I remember the, the, you know, the day after my ordination to the priesthood, I was opening cards and gifts from, from people. And I had one card and it was written in Ukrainian and I couldn't quite 
<clears throat> make out what the person was saying. Someone translated it for me, and it, the message was, Dear Father Joseph, congratulations on your ordination, something like that. We, uh, we look forward to your serving the Ukrainian nation, signed so-and-so. You know, so I was very much approached as, as a, sort of an ethnarch. Do I, do I think they had no religiosity? No, I just think that the way that they approached me was not how I, I not how I understand. I was not how I understood what I was doing. I was becoming a priest of Christ and of the gospel. Um, and, and also, as I said, I've encountered earlier, there's really sort of two, um, two attitudes and approaches I've encountered from lay people. The first one is sort of at best a lack of understanding. I don't understand why are non-ethnic members of our our tradition here. I've, I've had this before, you know. Well, don't you have an Irish church? Don't you have a German church to go to? Don't you have your own church? Why why would you come here? So at best and at worst, I have seen uh, racism. You know, this is not an American church, and and I've said even worse things that I I don't really want to repeat. Uh, I've, sorry, not said. I've heard worse things. Sure. I know what I, meant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, that I don't want to repeat here, but really it's things that have horrified me and that have been just downright sinful. And um, and so I think what we need is a culture shift, but a culture shift that's balanced, that's just Christian, theologically orthodox and incarnational and, and Christian. And, and at the end of the day, really charity. So mm. that so that when people walk into our churches. Eastern Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, whatever, even Latin Church, that uh, that they feel that the gospel is also theirs, that there is a God who loves them and who wishes them to be a full member of the family, not a guest, a member of the family. Father Joseph, I thank you so much for coming on and, and engaging this topic. I appreciate your message. I appreciate your ministry. Please tell us, how can we go to find out more about you? and What would you refer us to? Well, I'm just getting started, Michael, and uh, what I'd like to do, honestly, um, with regards to this is uh, if I can complete my studies and I'm working on writing my dissertation, and God willing, that's finished, I would like to write on this topic. Um, I want to leave something for, uh, I want to offer something to the church by way of a theological contribution mm -hmm. for future generations, because I care about my brothers and sisters. Um, right now, we have a parish here in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, where I'm currently serving, mm -hmm. where I think we try to model everything I'm saying. We are very um, Byzantine, and we are very much um, Byzantine Ukrainian in the sense that we we sing the services, we have the services. Um, our language, our default language is English, and I strive to be as faithful as possible to the inheritance that I have been given. And you know what? I'm not saying we're perfect, but I think we do a good job. I think we do a good job of taking the key of in Christian tradition and incarnating it for the people. And, and just the makeup of my congregation shows that. Young people and young families of every ethnic um, whatever grouping, including those descended from Ukrainian families, but also many, many families from other ethnicities. And we really are um, something that... Th those, not we, those people, it's really them. It's the Holy Spirit and God and their generosity and their charity, I think, is an example for what all Eastern Catholic churches can be. As a, no one's perfect, but I think they're doing a very good job. And, um, and they are very, um, I think, a powerful witness to what we can be. And I think if every parish can work to be like that, then I think we can... Uh, grow to being a strong force for evangelization and mission here in, in the Western world. Once again, thank you so much for coming on. And, and viewers, thank you all for watching. Please share this on your social media. Also help uh, this channel grow by hitting that like button and hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Lastly, check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason to theology if you like this show and you want to support it. All right, we'll see you later. God bless.